webinar is an opportunity to, you know, share some uh, learnings and insights into a program that Lyft Economy has been developing. And uh, well, there's a number of Lyft partners on the call. Maybe I'll just do a quick uh, check-in with the Lyft partners um, the, who can say hi. Maybe if Sean and Ryan and Andrew, if you want to say hello as well. Hi, everybody. Sean Berry from the Hudson Valley of New York. Go ahead, Andrew. All right. Hi, everybody. This is Andrew calling in from Oakland. And this is Ryan Honeyman from lovely San Carlos, California. If you know where that is, that's an important thing. <laughs> cool. Great. And we also heard from Erin Axelrod, who is a little bit BAM with Limited. Um, she's working with, with one of our Lyft clients uh, who has been investing in uh, some multi-strata agroforestry uh, reforestation efforts for carbon biosequestration in setting. So, um, and she's doing some verification work down there um, in the rainforest. So the, the Lyft team um, has been asked over many years, this, uh, the observation that we've had is that uh, there's a lot of interest in this idea of what does Lyft economy do? Uh, what is the next economy? And we get questions about, is there a way to, do you have a way to kind of share what you're seeing happening in the next economy um, in a way where um, maybe it could be learned, people want to play different roles. Some people want to be entrepreneurs and start their own social enterprise. Some people are just looking to navigate and kind of change their career and maybe uh, get a job or find a job that's more in alignment with their values. And, you know, there's other people who are looking for ways to invest uh, in um, financially and in other ways, just as a supporter in kind of this emerging possibility for an economy that works for the benefit of all life. And so we've uh, decided to kind of craft a kind of longitudinal training opportunity based on the last kind of eight years of work we've done that uh, will share skills that we're kind of half jokingly calling it in, in the next economy MBA. By MBA, it's, it's, about, it's about as accredited as uh, Trump University, which is to say it's not accredited uh, as a credential, um, but it kind of springs from our observation that most MBA programs don't explore a lot of the emerging, you know, content around what's happening in the next economy. And some of those themes include uh, one of the things we see is companies and enterprises that are truly trying to dedicate themselves to transforming the economy do things differently in terms of both how they look at impact within their organizations, a group of people kind of coming together and seeing their business and working together, uh, you know, delivering goods and services uh, actually as a crucible for personal growth and development. Like what does it mean if your business, the people that you're working with, if you're focused on using that as an opportunity to actually transform yourself uh, and the way you see the world, the way you interact both back at your, in your home and with your community, what would that mean? What would that look like? And that, not only just the way we interact and communicate with each other, but also you know, who owns these enterprises, the actual ownership structures. So we work with a lot of and help start a lot of organizations that take structures like multi-stakeholder cooperatives or worker-owned cooperatives or producer cooperatives um, or self-managed organizations, things that are uncommon and, and as far as we know, not actually explored or taught, at least with any rigor in any of the kind of business as usual, even sustainable MBA programs. We also look at impact outside of the organization in terms of how do enterprises uh, actually deliver goods and services in ways that actually enhance the environment and meet social objectives, social impact outcomes. Um, and this could be, you know, examples of that could be looking at regenerative uh, supply chain or looking at if there's a good, where did the, where does the materials, the supplies for the goods come from? Um, how do you make those trade-offs and arrangements such that those supplies are non-compromising in terms of their benefit to the world around you? 
and within which we live. What about hiring? You know, if you're growing a team, how about making sure that both the hiring practices and in terms of who you're hiring is actually creating uh, social transformation and social benefit. So those are some of the, the themes and arcs that, uh, and then there's some nuts and bolts, you know, actual business skills that kind of get interwoven with those next economy themes. So how do you, you know, manage a discounted cash flow statement thinking about these next economy principles and ethics? There's uh, a set of skills around doing standard business stuff that we want to share. And so we're kind of ex starting to experiment with formats to do that. Um, I'll pause for a moment and see if Sean or Ryan or Andrew want to add to any kind of context for this discussion. And then from there, I'd, I'd like to make it a, a discussion and see kind of what questions um, people are holding with regards to you know, this opportunity that we're creating for, uh, the, for 2018. Um, and in, in that way, those questions, I think, could provide learning experiences for us all today as well. Yeah, I think part of what, <clears throat> just to jump in here, this is Ryan Honeyman. Um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that I, part of the reason I think we wanted to create this course is like, what if, if I were starting out and, or, or at one of these transition periods, I would have loved to have a course that actually taught, because I was a solo consultant and thought a lot about going to business school, you know, paying 150 or 200 grand, uh, however many nights and weekends. And then you're still learning effectively to be, a. Uh, it's mostly tr um, targeted at getting you trained to work at a large multi multinational as sort of a middle management position as what most MBA programs are currently um, created for. So it was like, what if, you know, what if we want to start our own business and, uh, you know, be a transformative leader within a business um, or, or simply switch careers. And I think the, the difference even with this program was like Kevin was mentioning sustainable MBAs is that there's um, a sustainable MBA program might teach you to be a, a, a CSR director at Nike or something. And it's, it's like, um, I think what Lyft, one of the things that we've been focusing on is what are the sort of very emergent, what, we're, what Kevin referred to as the next economy. Um, so multi-stakeholder cooperatives, uh, you know, social enterprise, um, benefit, uh, companies that are regionally replicable instead of giant multinationals. So even the existing MBA programs that are sustainable are not talking to folks about what's potentially needed for more locally self-reliant economies. So that, that, that's sort of a, some insight into why we're looking at this. Uh, hi, this is Sean. Hi, this is um, I'm just going to add a couple uh, thoughts uh, and, and some context onto how we created this program. Uh, one is is just that uh, we come our, ourselves as the the partners at Lyft Economy. We come from the background of having started and run uh, multiple small next economy organizations, uh, just because we didn't know how else to do it, kind of thing. You know, uh, as starting with uh, in our early careers, um, without going into you know all the details of each organization, just. Uh, to reference that um, this type of program wasn't there and we kind of had to learn it on our own and you know somewhat the hard way and so as we've done that over the years uh, that kind of informed us founding Lyft Economy so that we could help other people uh, have, a, have a smoother learning curve and get these uh, organizations up and running because uh, we have a, a vision of an economy that works for our life and so uh, we need you all to participate and and to be uh, quickly creating these uh, profitable enterprises that are providing solutions. Um, and then uh, the other thing I'd mention on the course, just the, the style of the course is, as everything um, Lyft does is pretty small scale and pretty adaptable. Um, so we have kind of our observations and patterns of what contributes to, to making successful small organizations. Uh, but really we customize all of our, our trainings and services to who, who exactly is in the room, or in this case, the webinar, who's in the group, and where are you at and what do you need to learn. Um, and so we'll be adjusting uh, as we go to uh, what, what people are actually dealing with on, on, a, on a regular basis.
Aaron, it looked like you were going to say something. I just wanted to add that being a project based instead of developing a business plan that ends up with gathering cobwebs on your shelf, uh, what we hope for is that you're using the learnings as you build your business to provide needed goods and services in real time to your community. Um, and this really comes from our, um, our background in ecology and ecosystems and just looking at the ecosystemic collapses occurring in bioregions across, across the globe, how important it is for us to uh, be responsive and start taking action uh, to provide bits and services in regenerative ways to our communities. But also to our communities that are suffering from um, yeah, oppression and um, inequity and, and just yeah, all, the, all the social ills that come are extracted. Great. Thanks, Erin. And so I, I want to hear from some of the people who have gathered on the call and the, some of the intentions for this call. Um, I would love to share some maybe case studies and examples of what we, what we mean by the next economy. I do have, uh, um, you know, I could share my screen and show some of the templates uh, and tools that we've developed for skill building, uh, whether again, you're looking for life design and transitioning into a new role, a new job in the next economy, or if you're like, I'm starting a, a next economy company and I want to know how to access resources or even design an ownership strategy or an organization with regards to a team. Um, how do I think about, you know, the ownership of a company? How do I think about developing a value proposition for a market? We can cover all uh, of those types of aspects. Again, no matter where you fall in the different roles, just becoming an employee, getting a job, uh, starting a company, or even being an investor. Uh, so maybe I'll pause for a moment. Uh, and you know, if you could either use the chat um, to signal that you want to ask a question, um, Zoom has a chat feature, um, or uh, if, uh, with, if it doesn't get too awkward, you can go ahead and uh, ask a question directly. Let's give it a try for a second. Does anybody have any questions? Sofian? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for taking this call. It's pretty nice. Um, I had a question uh, regarding of uh, what you call the next generation economy. Uh, I see this transition back and forth with uh, uh, you know this benefit corporation and also what they call the certification of a regular business with benefit corporation, right? But what, what would you think uh, the next economy is? Is it more like forward, forward, like a benefit corporation, like with extra, extra, extra step? Or would you rather think that it's just a certification with like a stamp? It's a great, great question. And so to, I'll add color to, to the question. Um, in, in for, and for everybody's benefit, there's, there's a... A concept, a certification system out there, which is known as the uh, B Corp standard, which you could think of it as a certification or a stamp based on a you know set of practices that uh, companies use um, in terms of their interactions with their community of stakeholders, um, how they interact with their workers, how they interact with the environment. A number of factors go into a score. It's actually a 200 point score. And I think today, uh, Ryan Honeyman, who's one of our business partners, wrote, wrote the book called The B Corp Handbook. What, what is it today, Ryan, like 25, 2600 companies in the world? Yeah, about, about 2600 companies in the world are certified as B Corp. Uh, in our thinking at Lyft Economy, we see the B Corp certification as sending good signals and uh, we, sometimes jokingly refer to the B Corp standard within um, at Lyft economy as kind of business less bad. Um, it, it's not, we don't see that as transformative um, in terms of changing the very nature of the economy. That said, within the world of B Corps, 
within those 2,600 companies, there's a much smaller segment of organizations whose leadership is, I, I think, a bit distinct in terms of their intentions, where we've met with them and worked with some of them um, at Lyft Economy, uh, who are dedicated to um, a different set of principles. They, they've, they've found themselves as an enterprise within a neoliberal capitalist economy, uh, but they actually aren't satisfied with that. They want to know how can we actually change our businesses, change our ownership, change our way of having an impact that uh, changes the very nature of business. And it's, it's a tiny subset of those 2,600, maybe, you know, at most the top 10th percentile, but, but probably less than that, um, whose leadership is asking the question, how can I have uh, much more impact? And authentically asking the question, like, is having an enterprise that scales even part of what the next economy is? Um, so in that, that said, Sofian, I think what we see is um, within that set of B Corps whose leadership is authentically asking the question, how can we still provide needed goods and services to people in ways that actually benefit the environment or benefit all life? Um, it's actually really tricky and challenging. It's not actually that simple today to do that. And so if they're aware of the trade-offs they're making and trying to optimize in the impact, we think that's valuable. At the same time as when we see, we see some of those companies in the, with their leadership authentically trying to push the envelope of what impact means, there is an emergent set of organizations that are kind of starting from a different set of premises. And some of those maybe certify as a B Corp just as a means of uh, establishing themselves as part of that broader community and movement, but they are far and beyond what is measurable in that 200 point score in terms of the impacts that they're creating. We think that score is imperfect, but that score is objective. It's just a 200 points and it's, it's comparable. You can compare different uh, companies or different enterprises from totally different uh, industries. Uh, we think there's a number of subjective uh, uh, you know, uh, impacts that an enterprise could have that are not capturable in that uh, 200 point score. What we see as the next economy is more reflected in those subjective impacts that have a lot to do with um, how an enterprise thinks of itself in like a 500 year kind of perspective, not just what the next 10 years look like. Uh, Ryan or Sean, or does anybody want to add anything to that? That was pretty good. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. So uh, Dorian put in a question here. Hey, Dorian. Uh, working uh, with the new San Diego network uh, for a 50 acre permaculture sociocracy slicing pie initiative for those. So there's some jargon in there, which I can unpack for everybody. Um, we're starting to work through LLC, nonprofit, lease license, equity, except with all the agreements, all the, and it's these agreements and voluntary covenants that we enter into uh, in terms of ownership and how we organize our enterprises that really set a lot of things in motion in terms of our choices in, in order to, to emphasize uh, social and environmental impact in the future. So many of the choices that Dorian and his group in San Diego are looking at right now, should we be an LLC? Should we be a nonprofit? Um, should we raise resources through an equity arrangement and, and split ownership in that way? Um, those are the types of questions that ultimately put constraints as to what choices you, one can make in the future, even five years, 10 years, or even 50 years from now. Um, and so can, a question here, has Lyft developed a path template for the types of choices through which new additions have to work through and could be the extent to which this is distinct from classic business planning? Um, go ahead, John. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll just jump in and, and, and take this one. Uh, and thanks for the question. Uh, one thing that we've done since we started working as Lyft Economy uh, and being uh, systems designers that we are is we're always looking for the patterns uh, that, that we're observing uh, in the systems that, that we work with. So when we're working with small businesses, uh, what we've seen, uh, and this is probably about 150 or so companies over the last seven years that we've worked directly with, uh, we see that the, the patterns of those small companies are more similar than different. And from that, we've developed our business design methodology uh, that we use to uh, assess the stage of an organization and to develop a strategic path forward. Uh, and that's really the, the basis of uh, our, our MBA program is using that um, methodology. 
and, and basically applying it to your uh, projects, whether they're businesses or career changes. So that's, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that that's the, uh, some of the background which we've um, developed our methodology. Yeah, um, and maybe, Sean, hopefully this isn't redundant, but maybe to build on it a little bit is uh, the, it's funny that the, the, the voluntary, the, the agreements, the written agreements and some of the formal um, arrangements that uh, do um, kind of that are pattern based, that do kind of, uh, you know, address some of the how to, how to navigate into the initiatives that you're trying to create. It actually starts with one of these like um, almost cliche kind of ideas that we find the critical success factor for any enterprise moving into kind of the next economy or something that's new is actually explicit vision alignment. And you'll see in, in the training, um, and again, that sounds like such a soft thing to say, oh, vision alignment, are you aligned? Yeah, of course we're aligned. Um, but it actually means something to make uh, what's implicit typically extraordinarily explicit and say, are we actually aligned in what we want to achieve? And let's describe that to each other in as gross detail as possible, what our purpose is, what we're navigating towards. And even if you take that explicit uh, navigational waypoint um, and describe it and tease out any of the divergent ideas um, and come to accord and alignment, even if you don't actually achieve what those kind of where that waypoint is is headed towards, um, which is actually rare that people actually achieve that exact outcome. Um, the process of going through finding that alignment in our experience usually begins to make the questions of should it be an LLC? Should it be a nonprofit? Um, should we, uh, you know, license our approach or should we, um, you know, uh, raise equity financing, the questions that one has to ask usually fall out from the answers that develop in the alignment. That once you have an aligned vision, it becomes almost usually self-evident or trivial to make the selection of which strategy is the best. Um, and most people skip that step, do the formal agreements, and then have to undo the challenges that they've created for themselves by having the agreements before the alignment. Yeah, toward that point, Kevin, and this is Andrew Baskin uh, <clears throat> with Lift Economy. Um, Jonathan Hung had asked a question, curious about building a next-gen business or even uh, less bad, um, but with no traction or identified customer. Um, curious what kind of traction or prototype um, they would need. Um, it looks like Sean partially asked that question in, in the sense that we, like, that's a great question and those are the types of questions that we help support through this course um aaron was pointing out though maybe you can point out some of the things at the ideation and feasibility stage that are common mistakes that that people make before they jump into that that you were just talking about yeah i mean so like sean was speaking to the pattern um and to build off that andrew i'll i'll even actually share my screen with one of our templates so just something that we use really commonly in um, our process of helping organizations with their organizational design. Um, the template is called org design or org design 2.0 as the case may be. And one of the, which has a number of features to it as a template, there's some principles and kind of team orientation and org areas. And this provides structure. It doesn't matter if you're a multi-stakeholder cooperative, um, a worker-owned cooperative, a nonprofit. Every organization we've ever met has patterns of uh, structure and form uh, that kind of transcend their legal status. Um, and there are uh, certain kind of uh, uh, pieces of uh, action and tasks that uh, kind of we break them down into different stages. So to, to your question, Andrew, um, we look at the, the stages of development of different enterprises, at least in three uh, um, different kind of buckets. There's kind of feasibility stage organizations, and there's certain tasks that are, you know, we would say the prerequisite tasks to move from a feasibility stage, for example, to a proof of concept stage to some scaling. And scale doesn't necessarily mean scale by accretion or growth in that sense. 
scale can mean biomimetic scale of regional replication or open sourcing your model or franchising or sometimes we call it franchising that's a perfectly appropriate way to scale something and to grow something it doesn't have to grow you know as in like some kind of huge but in terms of feasibility um, we do say, see that starting with the vision and, and vision articulation of what is our purpose, why are we here, what do we want to achieve as being one of the, the first things to do. And there's a whole, um, this, there's a whole checklist of uh, more detail in terms of what each of these mean um, in our template. Uh, but actually then developing the beginning of culture, like who, who would be needed? It's a really key question um, that is great to ask right at the beginning. Uh, but then we also would say that to, to go into feasibility is actually doing some, uh, using some terms of business 101, which would be who is, who is the market? Who are you serving? What's the community that you're serving that you intend to serve? Um, and then being discerning about the positioning. And sometimes in the positioning, we talk about what are their needs that you, I totally want to address these needs. And then being really discerning as, okay, and what are their known needs? And what we mean by that is markets that we want to serve in our research, we can often identify that they need, you know, say food security or whatever the need might be. Um, but what is the language that they use to describe their needs to themselves? And that's a huge, huge, huge discernment in terms of its importance in terms of the impact of building a next economy enterprise is what is the, the needs versus the known needs. Um, we also, think it's important to develop a, uh, a, a operating projection so that you can start to build up the systems that you'll need in order to measure your progress. The, the, the dashboards or the feedback systems that we use in say permaculture design in general, getting the right feedback enables you to make the quote unquote, again, business jargon, forgive me, but the right pivots as to what choices you need to make to get towards having a feasible, repeatable, uh, enterprise where there's a reciprocity system that creates enough energy for the, the enterprise to continue so that you can uh, go to some growth, uh, some, some amount of scale so that you ha can reliably be providing your services to the community you want to serve. So these are some of these feasibility stage things. And each of these tasks, again, we have a, a system that's a little bit more elaborate to kind of go through those. Thanks for thanks thanks for that, Kevin. Just to, I, and I want to encourage folks to um, key in more questions uh, in the chat as they arise. Um, but maybe just just to contextualize what Kevin just shared, like especially for those if if you feel, happen to feel kind of intimidated by spreadsheets or something like that, like essentially what Kevin just showed is the system that we use to take folks through a process and through the both in, in actuality in their projects and also just through the way of thinking about it. So you can engage with that space in a way that's most values aligned, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, the, to build on that observation, Andrew, there's, there's a lot in the world of kind of like business 101 stuff uh, that if you take a ethical values aligned, say next economy lens or perspective, the the principles um, may be very similar, but the choices that one makes are just different. Um, and those are those are some of the things that we've I think gathered a lot of insights into. Uh, very you know as just an example, a lot of business one hundred and one will look at you know your um, say you say you're doing a product company. And it, it will, a business 101 advice or guidance or support would say, you need enough uh, gross margin, maximize your gross margin to be able to cover your you know, overhead. Um, so make sure that your cost of goods sold is as low as possible. Under the like unassumed, un unquestioned premise that you have to maximize profit to not only cover your overhead, but because returning profits to shareholders is the reason that businesses exist. Those stakeholders could be the owners or whoever. Um, in a lot of cases, we see, okay, what's the appropriate way to, sometimes we look at optimizing cost of goods sold so that you're actually investing in the impact outcomes that you're trying to create 
in such a way that you're able to have enough reciprocity to sustain the operation such that you can, can continue to invest in the impact you're trying to have um, on the land or with the people that are providing maybe some of the inputs to the goods that you're creating. So what's that optimum level rather than what's the, uh, you know, lowest cost of goods sold. So it's like business 101, but it's, it's different, obviously, right? Sean, you want to add to that? Yeah, I'd love to add to that. Um, you know, honestly, um, <clears throat> it, it, it's really more similar than distinct from classical business planning. It's just the shift is on the vision and values, right? And so as designers, the vision and values is primary. And so, you know, thinking about next economy impacts, uh, what, what's a vision that creates benefit for all stakeholders, right? And then what are the values for that business, uh, for the people in that business to embody while they're doing that? So once we have those, those are kind of like our pole stars for decision making. And as, you know, Kevin shared uh, some examples of, of you know, optimizing uh, rather than just uh, prioritizing profit as a unexamined assumption. Um, but once we have those vision and values, it does look fairly similar to, to, to traditional business planning in the sense that we need to look at spreadsheets, we need to know who's doing what roles, who's responsible for what, we need to have uh, you know, some onboarding, we need to have evaluations. Um, so we, we have a lot of the same things, uh, but each one of those things might look a little different, uh, uh, again, according to our values being um, primary. Uh, but uh, really, we want to use a lot of those uh, traditional skills for benefit. Um, we're just putting them uh, behind values-based endeavors. One other <clears throat> example that might be helpful for folks is, you know, Sophia had mentioned B Corps. Um, so one example might be a lot of companies that are thinking about the, the sort of uh, business, growing business, but doing it more sustainably. So you might have a company like um, Plum Organics, right, or Method Soap. I don't know if you guys know Method, but we could just use, um, yeah, well, let's use Method Soap. I Many of you have probably heard of them. So how, what, what, we, what we like about Method is it's taking the, the sort of complete opposite approach to say, uh, you know, the, the sort of like, um, Procter and Gamble, um, even <laughs> they're owned by SC Johnson now, which is kind of funny, but you know, they're, they're, they're taking the opposite approach of like how, what's like the most chemicals we can pack in for the least price is like the sort of traditional route. You know, they're taking what's the sort of best design and like treat our employees really well. And, um, the product is less toxic. And so that's, that's a, a big improvement over the, the sort of business status quo. What we would say on method is sort of like what, what we, we sort of, the, the critique we would bring is, you know, as method scales, um, you know, who benefits, right? Like it's great to have employee, great employee benefits uh, and treat your people well, but we would say, you know, do those employees have ownership in the company so that as it sort of grows and gets bigger, um, you know, that there's reciprocity to the employees, not just in the form of like a good, a good sort of, um, uh, a good salary, but also, you know, that, that sort of the, everyone benefits. You know, in addition, when something like Method got recently got bought by Ecover about two years ago or three years ago, and then Ecover got bought by SC Johnson, which is like this large multinational. But the the sort of who benefits from Method's success, like yes, it's a non-toxic, cool design product in the market, but there's probably a lot of rich white men who are the investors who benefited from Method getting bought. And so we're we're sort of looking at like what are the multiple layers of impact? Not that just you can build a product that's actually less damaging to the environment. Like that's awesome and we want to support that. But we also bring in different layers of like how do the workers benefit and not just as sort of options in the company. You know, a lot of tech companies will be like, I, we have a worker owner, we have a worker pool of options where they get, you know, they get a 1% or five shares in the company, but, you know, it still is forcing the company it still is not quite the same as say a, a, an actual ownership stake in the company as a worker owner. Um, and we want to look at the, the, who, the right investors to a company. So it actually benefits the community in addition to the product being better. So I think with this, with this project, with the next economy MBA, we're, we're sort of taking extra layer. We're sort of peeling more layers back and saying, let's examine each piece, each step of the process 
And um, while I'm not sort of saying that any of these sort of sustainable businesses are bad, that they're needed, but what's the sort of next iteration that brings the economy one step closer to benefiting everyone? Okay, I'm just uh, looking through the comments. I can respond to a couple of things. Uh, one, there's a question from Jeff of um, about you know saying he has some time sensitive needs to his organization, and uh, would it make sense to go through the course or work directly with with Lyft uh, as a consultant? Basically, we've developed the course to be a little bit more inclusive or more accessible to allow individuals to join over a period of time or smaller smaller organizations. Uh, but certainly uh, working directly with Lyft uh, in a consulting capacity is going to be more responsive um, and a quick, quicker to, to specifically the needs of your organization rather than fitting it in over the course of uh, the, the curriculum. I'm seeing here uh, another question about Islamic finance or Islamic economics, specifically interest-free, usury-free um, in terms of consideration of, of that. One of the ways we've structured the training is that the beginning of the training, we look kind of at some shared language and understanding of the next economy in general, in terms of what are the features and principles and where are we today and where do we want to be in, for where collectively does humanity want to be um, in terms of meeting everybody's needs with nobody left out um, for the benefit of all life for all time. You know that idea of the next economy, what, what does it look like in 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, 500 years? Um, and what can we do today? And the, one, of the, one of the features that uh, we think is really important to have a grounded understanding in is the current patterns and modalities in the creation of currency in the monetized economy. Um, which is usurious or at least interest-bearing interest debt-based currency by and large around the world. That said, there are multiple other currencies that do exist uh, in the uh, uh, monetized economy. But one thing that we'll look at in the understanding the next economy is what is the role of monetization in general? Where is it appropriate? How do we actually reweave and rebuild the non-monetized economy, sometimes known as the gift economy or the barter or exchange economy um, and both of those are different, but we'll actually kind of tease those out and make sure that we have a collective understanding of what role those play. And in the world of them, when we get to currency and what transactional facility currency can play as a role, what would be the optimal design of currencies um, in terms of their regionalization, in terms of their design and uh, re with regards to notions such as debt and, and ledger or um, is interest even uh, a concept that we would want to see in the, in the world and uh, in, in that exploration in that conversation um, I think we'll find that what we want to see is how can we build ourselves into a world where notions such as interest bearing debt um, as the mechanism for creating currency is probably antithetical to the outcomes that we want to see. And so in, the, in regard to that, we will have you know, a conversation. I think where it gets juicy for that, that question is what, what do we see happening today? And that might lead us into how can we actually, if we started an enterprise or, or what about the missing uh, community or alternative currencies that could exist today? And maybe one of you wants to actually start such an enterprise that is based around one of those currencies. We've worked with one of my one of our permaculture uh, participants started a currency called Baybox here locally, which Lyft Economy is a participant of, participant of. Baybox is a uh, is a is able to go into debt. It's a local exchange trading system based currency, but it has no interest. So it's a, it does have a ledger. Um, so debt is possible, but there is no interest. It's a non-interest bearing currency. And we think we'll, one of the questions we ask ourselves is how can we create a community of enterprises that, and, and of course culture and individuals that could support such currencies into the future, both in the near term and the long term. Um, so the next economy has many, many features of what it would look like, but I think currency is definitely one of the most important ones for us to get literacy and understanding of. 
Kevin, I'd like to draw attention to a question that Christine actually asked first before Jeff and um, uh, the other question that was asked, and she asked about the format of the small group. So I just wondered if maybe Ryan or Sean wanted to, or you wanted to speak to um, how we conceive of this as a, an opportunity to network um, like-minded individuals into you know, problem solving together. Well, some, some of it's going to be emergent, so big confession here. Um, this is our first time doing such a longitudinal kind of training program. Um, we've been asked by a number of people, so I'm just being a little vulnerable here. We don't have all the answers. We have done some online webinar training with um, a specific um, set of or, uh, individuals who were already involved in starting and growing their um, social enterprises and that we, we found success in that and more people have been asking us what about something that's a little bit more applicable to both people who are starting and growing enterprises but also people who are maybe even looking to get a job or just grow their literacy about what the next economy is um, or maybe they want to be a consultant like like at Lyft or something. And all those things are, I think, possible. So we've, we've kind of developed this curriculum and pedagogy to meet a broader set of needs. So again, complete vulnerability here. We don't have all the answers figured out. So some of the things we've thought of so far is whereas we will have, um, we, there is a curriculum that we've developed that has, uh, you know, uh, nine months worth of content to kind of cover, um, which would be recorded through webinars. Those webinars would largely be interactive, including full group discussion, not just some of this one question, one answer, one question, one answer, um, but actually asking questions of each other and sharing with each other um, is something that we want to facilitate. And uh, that will be a little bit different uh, in terms of the other webinars that we've done before. Second thing we will have is uh, we found it useful in our other online uh, offering to have a Facebook group. Uh, not that we love Facebook, but it, it was a way to facilitate communication in a closed group uh, that uh, we found to be effective in two ways. One, for some back and forth kind of polylogue or dialogue amongst the whole group, but also a, a way for us to share information um, with some of the templates um, so that they're always available um, to you. Um, you. You have one place to go where all the templates that we would share. And we do have dozens, I mean, maybe up to 100. We have dozens of templates um, that we'll be sharing throughout the training. And this, there's a third idea that we've circulated as a team, and I haven't read through the chat here and see if somebody brought it up, Aaron, to, to the, the question I was prompted, I think it was by uh, Christina, um, is this, uh, we do have this idea of potentially having some uh, loosely facilitated peer support dialogue of people who are taking the training. I think some of that probably depends on how many people sign up. I mean, there's a little bit of uncertainty as we go into this, just being fully vulnerable here. We, we don't know what it's, gonna, what it's gonna look like in the end. Um, but we're, I think Sean mentioned, part of our, 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 our spirit here is to make sure to co-create it so that it's creating the best outcomes um, you know, and we've designed the, our reciprocity uh, for offering such trainings to make sure that we're providing the best outcomes, because if we're not, then we didn't create value for you. And if I can buttress that a little bit, Kevin, just to, so, I mean, like Kevin's kind of framing that as vulnerability, but part, part of that is actually next economy thinking. So one book that we love is called Reinventing Organizations. And part of what they talk about in that book is kind of this different approach between plan and control versus sense and respond. And so we've kind of planned out a full curriculum on our end, but it wouldn't really be of the highest service to you if we just kind of took a formulaic approach to it. So we really try and adapt everything that we offer to your specific needs as, as you share. If you hear me, there was a question that Angelina asked about working within the automotive industry. Um, I just wanted to share a quick next time example of a cl Lyft client called Microworks um, that has actually been working with the automotive industry to uh, do research and development on growing um, automotive parts out of mycelium mushrooms, the uh, vegetative body part of the mushroom. Um, to see if they can actually create something that is more um, 
uh, protective within the automotive interior um, and actually you know better in terms of impact and also non-toxic um, so that would be another that's an even more extreme way to uh, use next economy principles in the automotive industry yeah some of some of my favorite uh, like it's it's interesting you look at every industry um, uh, one other Lyft client that was loosely related to the automotive industry it was kind of a, a company that was a interesting slightly vertically integrated uh, set of enterprises there's a dog patch biofuels and uh, a, a company called incredible adventures incredible adventures offered eco tourism locally in northern california uh, tours to for example yosemite and some of the uh, other state and national parks um, as well as chartered tours uh, what was interesting is they uh, they started it's like they had that company um, because the principals, the couple that started it, were very interested in biofuel um, and uh, specifically biodiesel. And so, but the demand for biodiesel was um, sporadic in the early days of kind of biodiesel being a permissible way of providing fueling for auto automobiles. Um, so they kind of had to vertically integrate to have uh, a stable demand. So they, they leveraged the demand for ecotourism um, and ran their buses on biofuel. So they had a fleet of buses and vehicles that had, were the stable demand for the biofuel station, which enabled them to provide biofuel to um, other vehicles. One thing that we liked about working with them at Lyft is they had a vision for that as being a model um, to start alternative fueling stations um, uh, around the, the country, around the world, is if you marry a, a ver partially vertically integrated um, enterprise family where you have, um, in this case, they had kind of almost had three uh, operations where they're actually fixing and working on uh, vehicles, uh, they were fueling vehicles, and then they were offering these eco-tourism kind of chartered uh, vehicles that, um, chartered uh, tours that uh, used the services of the other enterprises as a as a nucleus that was something that they were hoping to uh, open source and replicate uh, around the world and we we, lo we love those opportunities where um, sometimes a single entity by itself without a family of enterprises around it to to bolster and buttress the the demand characteristics um, sometimes we see that's what's needed to actually jumpstart the next economy is finding those really creative partnerships. Let's see, there's, I'm going to kind of go through the questions here, see if anything else popped up. Kevin, we might take the next eight minutes to share a little bit about kind of technically how people sign up. Um, sure. Yeah, um, the uh, we do have um, the the content of the classes will be. Um, we tried to find a time where we thought it would be most accessible, given that people are might be joining from different time zones, um, even even around the world. Um, unfortunately, this class will be only available um, in English, but we will record all the webinars. Uh, the online classes will be two times a month. Um, and they'll be kind of 90 minutes where we'll be sharing content from a uh, kind of curriculum that we've outlined that has lots of uh, templates and content that we'll be sharing um, around kind of the next economy and then how next economy enterprises are designed with regards to the vision, culture, strategy, their operations, what marketing means, the next economy, sales, uh, delivery, service, and then some of the nuts and bolts of accounting and IT and legal, just how enterprises operate in the next economy with a grounding in the next economy. The first six sessions will be kind of the most, um, uh, let's see, uh, making sure we have a shared language and shared understanding of what the next economy is and what we're, what we're growing in towards. 
um, how to assess and evaluate your own opportunities in your own life design. We'll actually do some, you know, op- make some space for those of you who are really interested in designing your own life. That, that might mean thinking about your vocational path and what jobs you want to find or already have or transitioning a career. Um, or maybe it is moving from changing your job to then maybe becoming an entrepreneur and starting an enterprise Um, Or maybe you have an enterprise and you're looking to grow the family of enterprises that actually sustain and change the practices within your your current work. Uh, So the first six sessions, and I think we've discussed the possibilities. We've been asked by a few people that who might want to sign up for just the first six sessions. Um, And so we'll make that as one possibility for registering that somebody wants to sign up for just the first six. Uh, And uh, the... um, you can sign up for the entire training. There is a